Welcome everybody to today's webinar. It is my great pleasure to host Dr. Cheng Yi Lam, who is a at the National Taiwan University. Um, Dr. Lam will talk about a field study on critical height sampling, and he will first give a presentation and we'll have some time for questions and uh, question and answer period after um, the plans to wrap up the official part by 11 p.m. Vancouver time at the latest. Um, but if there are still questions, uh, we can stick around a while, a little bit longer. Uh, before I hand uh, the presentation over to Alam, I would first like to acknowledge that I'm hosting this webinar from my home in Port Coquitlam, British Columbia, which is located on the traditional ancestral and unceded territory of the Coquitlam First Nation. I thank the Coquitlam who continue to live on these lands and care for them. Uh, second, I would like to remind you all that the webinar is being recorded and will be posted on the AUFRA webpage. And I would also like to acknowledge that the webinar concludes the 2022 Forest Menstruation and Modeling Chats, uh, which are organized by IUFRO Research Group 401 Forest Menstruation and Modeling, and that we're currently planning. Uh, the webinars for 2023. If you have any speaker suggestions, please email me uh, at bianca.eskelson at uvc.ca. As uh, this is an IUFRA event, I would like to highlight IUFRA's mission to advance research excellence and knowledge sharing and to foster development of science-based solutions uh, to forest-related challenges for the benefit of forest and people worldwide. The webinar series is being organized in the spirit of knowledge sharing and to allow for some interaction and networking while there are still uh, very few in-person IUFRA meetings due to COVID. And it's very exciting to see lots of folks join from lots of different countries uh, for all these webinars. Uh, with that, uh, I will stop sharing my screen and please help me welcome Lam for his presentation. Hey, thank you. And I will share my screen right now. Hmm. Hey, uh, my hope that people could see it. Okay, I'm going to change the presentation mode. Okay, is it okay? Okay, so uh, thank you everyone for uh, attending my talk and about the critical height sampling and his uh, antithetic variants. Uh, critical height sampling is a uh, sort of a passion project of mine. And uh, I think that critical height sampling is very elegant from the point of geometrically. And it was not so much of a uh, geometrical, it's not so much of theoretical limitations, but it is more of a uh, limitation on the technology that whether we could implement um, critical height sampling. So I'd be interested, I've been interested in critical height sampling for a long time. And I, I really like to share what I've been working on. So, well, I, I just I like to talk a little bit about history of critical height samplings. And critical height sampling was independently discovered by Kitamura as well as Kim Isles independently and on different times of uh, dates. Kitamura first published about the critical height sampling in 1964 paper. He actually published the critical height sampling before 1964 in the 1962 um, talk, but it was uh, difficult to obtain publication because I spent about a year asking for friends and favors in Japan. They helped me be able to obtain a copy of the 1962. But the 1964 paper is much easier to obtain. It's available online. And King, dis King also discovered the uh, critical height sampling in his uh, dissertations. In, he documented the critical height sampling in his dissertation in 1979, but he did discover the critical height sampling during his master's degree at Oregon State University. Now, throughout the over the few last few decades, there were not many um, there were not many studies done on the critical height samplings, and these are some of the publications that I can I try to collect over the last few years. And then, uh, as you can see, that most of them are being most of the research work on critical height sampling was done in the early '60s to the '90s, and then there's some in the 2010s, but there's not a lot of that. So what is critical height sampling? Critical height sampling is the only sampling design with probability proportional to volume. So when you sample the trees, you're actually sampling the tree volumes and the larger the tree volume, the, the higher probab probability that you're going to select it. 
And the team says that the horizontal uh, critical height sampling CHS is a three dimensional extensions of uh, horizontal point sampling. You can imagine that uh, at each infinitesimal height along a tree trunk, you expand the tree radius by a constant P and the P is the ratio of the expanded radius over the tree radius. And so when we expand the tree volume, you actually expand the tree volume by P squared times volumes. So when you expand the whole trunk to expand the volume itself, you can see it's actually mirroring, mirroring the real tree forms. So it's just a bigger form. It's a, just a bigger uh, size, the imaginary size. So when you try to do critical height samplings, you actually do not need to rely on volume as equations to estimate tree volumes or stand volumes. So critical height sampling has the potential to avoid any model bias that goes into building that volume equations. So then what is critical height? What's the definition of the critical height? Uh, at a, so let's say that now we select a random point P as here, and then the P is within the imaginarily expanded tree balls around the tree. And then you project a vertical ray towards the zenith to the skies. And then when the, the point that the vertical ray leaves expanded zone is the critical point. And then the critical height will be the vertical distance from the ground surface to that critical point. Well, it, it, it is pretty hard to imagine a imaginary expanded zone around a tree bow. So if you look at critical height from another perspective, you can imagine that with every BAF base area factors, you are uh, have a angle openings. Now, the when the tree is selected by a specific BAF, which means that the tree at 1.3 meters at breast height is larger than the opening angle. So if you could imagine that you levitate yourself above the tree vertically, and then the point where the opening angle just subtain the tree trunk or tree stems, and that height is the critical height, just like this opening angle, specific alpha, subtend the tree trunk at this point. So this will be the critical height. And then if you can able to find that point, then you can measure the height. So, but then what kind of instruments will you use to find that point? Well, there are, to me, there are three kinds of instruments that are available. One, the most, uh, the most direct way of finding the critical point is using the Spiegel radioscopes. And for Spiegel radioscope, you will need to stand at the plot centers and then side to choose a BAF. And then when you sight above the trees, and then you find the, where the tree trunk obtains the opening angle of the, of the BAF. And because the Spiegel radioscopes has a automatically adjusting for slope, so it's, you could just actually directly cite the critical point. And then you can use a, if you know the distance to the tree, the resco also allows you to measure, directly calculate the height. Another two in, instruments that we can use to find the critical points and then critical height is the Wheeler pentaprisms or the Criterion RV1000s. Now Wheeler pentaprisms using the theory, uh, using the basic theories of two, Pentaprisms, and then try to find the try to find the uh, the where the critical height is uh, is using optical illusions or optical way where the criterion RD uses lasers, and so with the wheel of pentaprisms and criteria, you can move around the plot. You don't have to stay at the plot centers, but to do that, you require it requires you to measure the horizontal distance from the plot center to the tree, and then then you can calculate the critical diameter for the tree using the the, the limiting distance equations. So there's basically two or three in instruments that allows us to directly uh, to directly determine where the critical point is, and then to determine um where the critical height is.
So how do we do it in the field? So first, like any sampling strategies, you establish a random sample point. And then at the random sample points, you establish a horizontal point sampling, or you don't need to uh, a horizontal point sampling plot with a selected BAF uh, based factors. And using the angle gauge or prisms, you identify the entries. And then for the end sample trees or for the end entries, you just need to determine their critical heights using radar scopes or using the real pencil prisms. And then the estimated volume per hectares for the sample point will be the sum of the critical heights of the sample trees and then multiply that sums with a BAF. So it's very easy to calculate volume per hectares and you don't even need to touch the tree. So, and you don't re re really need to rely on any volume equations and it does, it gives you directly a volume per hectare estimates. So, so I was looking, when I was looking through the, um, the literature that I've been trying to find, I'm trying to find whether I can, whether there's a, a really nice proof for the estimators uh, that shown before. Well, Kim says that the proof was very intuitive and I believe it's true that it was quite intuitive. But Tom and Bailey and Tom approached the proof from three table equations. And I sort of find that proof sort of um, a bit complicated. And so I'm, I'm just hoping to whether I can have some nice and elegant proof that they will always want to find. So Kitamura in 1964 in his papers provide a brief proof. So this is a proof uh, in Japanese. Uh, we, we got a text translator, so any, uh, but we only translate in Chinese. So if anyone is interested, we can, I can share the text. And in the proof is uh, Kitamura says that it was quite intuitive. The, the proof was quite intuitive when I was somehow not, I, I can follow the proof, but I was somehow not quite satisfied with how the proof is going. And, but if you look actually, if you look closely at the way that Kitamura proved the volume per hectares um, estimations, you find that Kitamura is framing the proof in terms of the continuous population sampling theories. So this gives me an idea that if I can go to look at the continuous population sampling theory, maybe I can somehow provide a, a more uh, elegant proof or more clear proof. So I go. To, I went to Gregor and Valentine book in from two thousand seven, and they have very really nice um, uh, chapters on the continuous population sampling theories. And this comes out from the page ninety three to one hundred twenty six. So anyone have the books, it, it just you can refer to that. So let's look. So the so we use a crude Monte Carlo methods. A crude Monte Carlo method is analogous to simple random sampling in discrete populations. So let's say that you have an area around the uh, around the uh, expanded trees, tree um, the tree expanded zones. So which is bounded by zero x zero to x max, and then on the y axis is bounded by y zero to y max. So the green shape here is the expanded tree volume which is p squared times v, the, the tree volume, the actual tree volumes. And let's, let's say that I randomly select a sample point, which is the, the xs and ys, which is the, my sample point, which is randomly selected. And then according to the critical height uh, methods, then you, vertic you basically vertically look up and then project a ray upward to the zenith. And then once it touches the expanded trees volume, that is where the critical height is. And so let's denote the critical height as the L um, X at the locations X, Y, and uh, X, S, and Y, X. So uh, let's assume that the area surrounding the expanded volume is A, which is essentially just a, uh, integrations of the two dimensional integrations of the x axis and y axis but because a center point a sample point is randomly selected the probability the probability densities 
at the, the a specific point that you randomly select this is just a over uh it's just a over one one over a sorry it's one over a so it's basically that the uh at, at an infinitely small points what's the probability that the point will be selected so according to Bregor and uh, Valentine book an unbiased estimated for the total expanded volume and the random rotations will be a is critical heights, the critical height that you measure at these locations divided by the, um, the densities at these locations. So this is the, the, the total volumes, expanded volumes. So if you work around this equation a little bit, we know that the total volume of the tree is essentially P squared times that estimate the tree volumes. And then we know that the uh, denominator is one over A. And then if you shift things around and you got the A over P squared times the critical height. So I'm wondering that whether we can prove this estimator so if you take an expected value of the of the uh, if you take the expected value of the the previous equations here the expected value of the estimator for the three volumes and then which is you plug in the equations over over the expectations and then the expectation is essentially just a uh, uh the, so it's the integrations of every point times this density at that point. And then because this, the density itself is a constant, so you can move out it. You can move out of the integrations. Now this, integr uh, this integration, the two dimensional integrations, basically you can imagine that summing up at all the infinite points within this area, within this area. And then what you have, if you sum up all the vertical heights, all the possible vertical height within this X and Y area, and what you have is essentially just P square V. So then the ex then it's nicely that show that the expected um, the expectations of the estimators is equal to true um, volumes of the tree. So we do have a unbiasedness, I uh, have an unbiasedness proof for the estimators. So let's say that right now there are two trees in the area A, and then let's denote L, the capital L, as the sum of the critical heights of two trees. So if you look at this point here, XS and YS, the, because the, the expanded zone of the two trees are overlapping over the points, so which means that both trees are the sample trees for the point, for the random sample point there. Then one tree, the first tree, the green expanded tree has a, um, has a critical height of L1 over the sample points. Well, the uh, magenta purple trees has the, uh, the L2 critical heights over the sample points. So assume that, uh, let's denote that capital L is the sum of the critical height of two trees, which is the L1 plus L2. And let's denote the capital V as a sum of three volume of two trees, which is the sum of the, the first, the true that three volume of the first tree plus the true tree volume of the second trees. So using the previous estimators, the continuous population sampling estimators, so they, you just replacing the numerators with the capital L rather than the small L. So same thing, if you work things around and then shift things, the parameters around, you get that the estimator of the total volumes is equals to an area of the area of your interest divided by P squared times the sum of the critical height of the two trees. That's our estimators. So, to find, to find the unbiasedness of this estimator, you still take the expectations and then we still doing the same things. And so you put the integration in it, but right now you are integrating the two, you integrating over the capital L. So because the L is the sum of two 
uh, critical heights. So because the integrations is essentially just summing up all possible critical heights at any single points along within this area. And then you end up with the P squared V1 plus P squared V2. So very, very nicely that P squared get canceled out. And then we have a proof that the expectations of the vol estimated volumes of the trees is equal to the actual volume of the two trees. So the proof we can generalize to any sample point within um, an area A and then to any numbers of the sample tree N. So, so we have L equal to sum of I equals to one to N plus all the critical heights and the sample points. And then, so you're just going to have the estimated volume of, of A over P squared times the sum of the critical heights of how many N trees over that area of the sample points. So if we let the area be one hectares, which is 10,000 square meters, then the estimated volume per hectare will be 1,000 over P2. Now we, this is the well-known BAF equations for the horizontal point sampling. So we have, we show that the, uh, the volume per hectares, uh, estimated volume per hectares is unbiasedly, you what know, is unbiased in terms of just BAF times the sum of the critical height. So, well, all roads lead to unbiasedness, whether the Matal and Matal uh, papers, they're using three tables, or Lynch Tom's paper, they're using three tables, and I, we believe all the uh, Peter Mura's ways of using their ge geometries. I think he used, uh, he used the uh, continuous populations or geometry integration quite differently, but we all believe that this all shows that from multiple perspective that we have an unbiased estimator for the critical height samplings. But one nice thing with that, or one nice thing that with the continuous population sampling theory is that we can ex, we can have a little bit of extensions. So with these estimators that show here, um, the every point, every single random point is a random sampling. But the, the, it doesn't have to be so because at this we have really good um, remote sensing data at this moment. So the pixels are very, very have high resolutions. And then we have, we can extract a lot of proxies from remote sensing data. So essentially now that you have a wall to wall and pixel by pixels of a proxies that is highly correlated to the volumes that you can extract from a remote sensing source. Then what we want is that we can have a, we can select sample points with probability proportional to these proxies so that the sample point not only just randomly uh, selected over a, an area, but it can be more informed. It can be a more informed selections of where I want to do critical height samplings. So nice thing is that this comes, um, Gregor and Valentine shows that if you're going to do some kind of a probably proportional to some covariate samplings over a continuous population sampling theory, that is the theory of the important samplings. And you can use the idea of important sampling, uh, which is analogous to list samplings in the, um, in the, in the discrete populations. So what you need to do is that this density here will be replaced by a important sampling. So you, you're, going to have a, you're going to have a proxy sampling design. Now, uh, I, I'm not sure whether if, when, if you're going to do this, whether the critical high estimators will still be unbiased, but I, I believe so, but I think we, there's still a lot of work to, to show that. So, uh, so that's the uh, that's that's what I did. We trying to find a uh, proof that can satisfy my own ego and or my desire to know whether I can show the proof of the estimators. And as Kim has said, it's, it's actually quite intuitive. 
So now the next thing is that I like, because this is more about the field studies, so I'd like to know that what are what kind of field issues when you're trying to use radioscopes to do critical height sampling. So if the trees are far away, uh, using the radioscope height, using a radioscope to sight the critical heights, usually the critical height will be quite low on the tree trunks. So the sighting is actually quite easy. However, when the trees are really close by, you're going to break your neck, you're going to break your neck, you're going to break your back, and then and it's hard to sight the, the, where the critical point is because the critical point will be very, very high on the tree and you're going to have a really, really steep sighting angles. So what the Tom and Jeff did is that they developed a antistatic importance critical height samplings. What it does is that when the tree are far away, the antistatic critical heights will be high on the tree trunk. So your, your sighting angle will be higher compared to a critical height samplings, but it's still comfortable to do that because you don't need to crank your net so much. However, when the trees are really close by, the anti-static importance critical height will be low on the tree trunk. So compared to a critical heights, and this is nice because then you don't have, you don't need to have a really, really steep sighting angles and it will be easier actually to sight the, where the critical height, uh, the anti-static importance critical height is. So I'm, I'm very interested in what Tom and Jeff did. I think this is something that is really fun. And also it did solve the issues with, uh, with using radioscopes in the field. So, but to calculate the volume per hectare is a, bit, a little bit more complicated. And we have the equation here, Jeff and Tom, uh, Tom and Jeff developed the equation here to calculate volume per hectare. Uh, in the field, it does require a little bit more of measurements. You need, well, of course, you need to determine where the height to the anti-static critical height is uh, using these equations. The, is, but to, to determine where the diameter of the anti-critical height, you need to determine where the critical height, uh, the critical diameter is. To determine the critical diameters, you need to measure the horizontal distance from yourself from the point from the plot center to the tree. And then in the equation here, you need, in the equation here, you will need base area of the tree. So which means that you need to measure the deviation of the trees. And then uh, on this last part of summation here, what it does is that it's trying to account for the tapers of uh, 1.3 uh, from the ground to the 1.3. So you will need to measure a random diameters between zero to 1.3 meters. So even though in the field, the, um, the anti-static critical importance critical height sampling is nice for rare scopes, but it does require an additional few measurements in the field. However, if you are comfortable assuming that the tree trunk below 1.3 meters is cylinders, then you could you do need to measure the random diameters between zero meters and 1.3 meters. And you can simplify the summation here to the, to the, uh, to the, um, to, to just the height to the base area. So what is the, motivation for my project is that almost previous work on critical height samplings are theoreticals or with very limited field samplings. And Kitamura in 1964 proposed a form of two-phase samplings and then use a point samplings and then try to use a critical height sampling on the second phase. And also Kitamura in the, in the same paper, he, he proposed an estimator for the stand tapers and which is we are trying to also trying to figure out what this estimator is going to is doing. But essentially what Kitamura says that if you have a average tree height of uh, average height of the sample trees, it is possible to calculate the stand form factors from the 
critical height samplings. And I believe that there are actually many potential for critical height samplings. So my whole critical height sampling project or program consists of these several objectives. One, the first one is to compare the field estimator mean and precisions, and then the uh, of the different the critical height sampling, the anti-static variance. And I was hoping to, uh, to look more into Kitamura proposal of the stand diamond, stand table estimators. Then perhaps that is the future possibly of sampling we probably proportional to stand table or who knows. And then uh, one really interesting or interesting idea that, that we are trying to explore is that critical height sampling may be really field intensive. So you, to do it alone may not be uh, cost effective, but how, what if borrowing the idea from Kitamura, what if you do a two-phase sampling such as a big BAF or you use a big BF count in the first phase and then second phase, you see a critical height samplings or First phase, you establish the plot and then using volume equations. And then second phase, you do a critical height sampling. So using something like a ratio estimator to adjust the bias. And then the fourth objective that we have is actually to analyze the cost plus loss analysis based on the Fairfield-Smith relationship, relationships uh, that has been done by Tom in his works. And then we, my, I, we, we have the idea that critical height sampling is not so much of a theoretical, theoretical limitations, but more of a technical limitation. So what we're trying to do is that to develop a measurement tools that allow us to quickly or more conveniently determine where the critical point is, as well as where the critical height. So uh, because this is just a very preliminary study, so I'm just going to talk about the first items of the, our project. So we established a few studies at the National Taiwan University Experimental Forest in two plantations. One is the Pitomeria japonica plantation, or commonly the species known by Sugi. And then another is a local species from Taiwania, Pitomeria loritis, and we just call it Taiwania. And there are 20 sites in, in Sugi, and then there are 30 sites. We established the plots at the spacing, uh, the expandable plots that have been uh, maintained by the NTU expandable forest. And the initial planting densities uh, range from thousands to 10,000 trees per hectare. For Taiwan, it's about 50 to 1,000 trees per hectare. The stand age, current stand age is 68 to 92 years old. And then the standard for the Taiwanian is 40, 50 to 56. So the Taiwanian stand is a, a little bit younger than our Suki stands. For the, the reason why we established in two different tree species plantations, one is because the reason is because of the way the species tree structures are. For Suki, the foliage tends to be more clustered and dense. And then there's often Apophytes, and then there's also a lot of some trees are forks due to squirrel damage. For the tree for Taiwania, uh, the trees are more the crown are more sparse. There's a lot of lights going through the crowns, and then the bowl are really clean. We very very few uh, most of the time very few apophytes, and because the squirrel doesn't like the Taiwania trees, so there's almost no forking at all. So you have really nice clear bow and stems. So we are, at each site, we, at the center of each experimental plus, we establish a horizontal point samples with BF equal to three. And then we measure the DBH, the total height and the horizontal distance. And then on the same side, we establish a critical height, anti-static, anti-static uh, anti importance critical height samplings. But because of the amount of time that we have, I, we, can, we can only establish six, nine, and 12 EAF. And we measure the critical heights as well as the anti-static critical heights. And we measure the diameter at random between zero to 1.3 meters. And we also carry out a time studies. So we record the times of, that needed for us to identify trees with angle gauge, needed the time to measure horizontal distance, the time the separate times to measure DBH, separate time for heights, uh, random diameters, 
critical height as well as the separate time for anti-static critical height so that we could carry out the cost plus loss analysis with the Fairfield Smith relationships. Uh, we're still collecting uh, data right now. We are hoping to, we, uh, this data, we present only data for 50 plus, but we're hoping to be able to collect around 60s and 65. I think that should give us a lot of uh, degree of freedom for the analysis. So we choose to, to compare, we choose two volume equations for the SUGI. There's one volume equation developed by Yang in 1975 and another one in 2008. And you can see that the, the, the volume equations, um, the, the trees, the sample trees that used to develop volume equations are quite a little bit different than uh, the range of the trees that we sampled. For Taiwan Yale, we also have two volume equations. One is from 1990, Liu and Chang, 1991, and one is from Chu, 2008. And um, there's, we couldn't find Taiwania volume equation for our location. So we would have, we have to use volume equations from South Central Taiwan, as well as from the Southern Taiwan. And you can see that the, um, the diameters, the diameters of the tree, sample trees used to build the volume equations are within or or within our, the, the trees that we samples. But uh, uh, for the Yang 1975 equation for Suki, uh, he, he established the volume equation with 500, about 600 trees from our experimental forest. So we would expect that these volume equations will perform well compared to critical height samples. So for the first result for Suki, so the red lines are the estimated mean volume per hectares over different basal area, basal area factors, BAF. And then the bar indicates the standard errors. This is for the, the red is for the yang, the brown is for the yen, and then the blue is for critical height samplings. Um, the green is for the anti-static critical height samplings, and then the Purple is assuming cylindrical trunk for the anti-static pre-line samples. So looking, comparing between the volume equations and the uh, critical height samplings, we found that the critical height samplings estimated volume is closer to Yang. And this is expected because Yang used about 600 trees from our, the, our university experiment forest to build the equations. And then the the range of the diameters that built were actually smaller than our diameter, than the trees that we sample today. So we would expect some kind of bias from the yen, or from the Young equation for 1975. But over the over the base area factors, the estimated mean for the HPS was more variable. So you can see they are going down as the uh, as the BAF increases. But critical height sampling actually has a more consistent in the estimated mean going from six, nine, and 12. So comparing between the critical height sampling and his antistatic variants, we found that the antistatic variants are more variable, especially if you look at the DF trials, that it suddenly dropped below the, 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 the estimated mean compared to the critical height samplings. And as expected, if you assume that the trunk is cylinders, then you have lower stand volume than the anti-static critical height samplings. And for Suki, we found that the anti-static critical height sampling estimated were much closer to the critical height samplings. So if you look at Taiwania, the another tree species, and we found surprisingly that the, um, the critical height samplings are more closer to the Liu and Chang 1992 uh, volume equations compared to the Chu volume equation from 2018. And if you, but both equations are from South Taiwan, they are not really where the sample trees are not really from where we sampled. And then the, as you can see, the sample tree used to build the models, uh, the DBH are smaller than our sample trees and the height is slightly smaller. Well, 
if you remember the Suki relay, the Suki um, uh, results, it, when you increase the base area factors, the estimated volumes are uh, decreased, the mean estimated volume decreasing, but for Taiwania, it's actually increasing. And we still try to figure out why is that. But however, consistent with between Taiwania and Suki, what is consistent is that the critical height sampling, the estimated means are more or less the same, the consistent across EAF. Now the result with the antistatic critical height samplings are quite similar, but was a little bit different than the Suki. What we know, we, all, we always expect that the cylinder, the cylindrical trunk assumptions will have, uh, will estimate lower stand volume than the antistatic critical height samplings. But we found that the, uh, there are more variations in terms of the height estimated from the antistatic critical height samplings uh, compared to in the mean. I mean, in the, the mean are more variable than the critical height samplings. So in terms of efficiency, if we divide the standard errors of the critical height sampling over the standard error of the HPS, horizontal point sampling using volume equations, well, the critical height samplings are less efficient than HPS, but it really depends on which volume equations that you use. Uh, the efficiency could be 7% to 13% less, or it could be up to about 100% less. So it really depends on the type of the equation they use. But among the uh, different BAF, the BAF9 is essentially the most efficient. So we expect that the critical heights and the anti-critical height to be uh, and inverse relationships, and this is what we expected. The, the relationships are actually uh, inverse, but there's a lot of variations in this relationship. So we're still trying to figure out um, why or what contribution, what contributes to these variations. So, well, the, the main points that from our preliminary results, the main point that there are model bias, as we expected when you use different models, it gives you different um, volume per hectare estimates. But it doesn't, we, do, we, we, we avoid the implication that critical height sampling is accurate or the volume estimated, the volume per hectare that we get from critical height sampling is the true, um, the truth. But we, we, we cannot apply, we cannot imply that, but critical height sampling does give us a reference point of comparisons because it, when we only rely on the uh, equations, and um, one equation to decide which one equation is appropriate, we, we don't have the reference point of comparisons. So critical height sampling could provide a reference point of comparisons to allow us to evaluate different um, volume equations. And one thing is that we observe is that the estimator means are quite variable for HPS. In our, in our, sam in our sample plots for three BAF, we have an average of 22, 22 trees for the six, and around 11 for the nine, we drop down to eight, for the 12, an average of about six trees. Well, looking at the standard error, we found that even though the means are quite variable, but this, they are most likely not going to be significantly different at 95% confidence intervals. But it does back the question is that how could we, how to choose a BAF for two forests? So for Sugi, the estimated means increasing when you increase the BAF for Taiwania, it decreases when you increase the increasing the BAF. However, one nice thing with critical high sampling is that it, 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 it basically doesn't matter which BAF you use, you're going to have that consistent mean. And so it does uh, release, a, a, it may come as a relief that um, we don't have to, use. We, we could choose, a B, we be more comfortable choosing a BAF, and, but then, Critical high sampling, you're going to have the operation constraints. However, another downside of critical high sampling is that you need more plots to reach the same level of precision as the, as the HPS. But however, if we can look at more with, if we can develop 
more with the two-phase sampling strategies using the ratio estimations, estimators to correct for the volume that might be a way forward. Or looking at between the anti-static variants and the previous high samplings, we know that it's not it's probably not safe to assume that trunks are cylinders, cylindrical. So you do need to measure the random diameter if you're going to apply the anti-static high samplings. And variations in the estimator mean for the anti-static var variance of the periodic sampling does need to consider what kind, what choice of BAF you need to use when you're going out to the fields. Well, because in our studies, we use a realer pencil prisons. So actually, it, it probably doesn't matter with the anti-static critical height because we realize you can move around, so you're not going to be stationary at at the uh, at that point at the sample at the plot centers. So there's still we believe that there might be some kind of measurement issues, uh, because the relationship between the anti-static heights and the and the critical heights are quite variable, but it's something that we still need to look at more. So what are the, some of the few challenges with the real pentaprism when pentaprisms? Uh, our students say that you shouldn't use it more than four hours a day if you want to have a good eyesight for the rest of your day. Um, uh, it's, it's, it's quite difficult uh, sighting with real for the uh, for the critical height. And then sometimes even in some plantation, we, you still need to crank your neck a little bit. In Taiwan, in our mountains, we do get foggy uh, and misty days. So students are pretty happy when they get this day because they can take the afternoon off. Because, if, because the sighting we will uh, is, is not ideal and because this is experiments, so we usually don't do it. So it does require good sunlight when you try to site, use real pentaprisms. So we Japonicas, you, you can see that there's a, with Suki, you have a huge dense um, crowns, and then sometimes the trees are forked. And when we do encounter forking trees, we choose the largest stands of the fork and it keeps sightings. And this, we believe that this could have some issues in our estimations, and this is the challenges we're facing. And um, another question that we during a field we came back is that we know that volume, anything above forking has no timber value. So anything below forking has timber value. So how, but the critical heights might not stop at the fork, it goes high up. Then how can we reconcile that we need just need merchantable volume but not the total tree volume so there's something that is uh what we we, we we are thinking about and then dense understory conditions are not really ideal for sightings we have to chop well for the experiment purpose we clear a lot of understories condition understory to try to get a good sight of the trees so we, we some of the critical heights we do have to do visual estimates. It is it's unfortunate because Wheeler has a limitation of five centimeters, but our but we do have critical height which is less than five centimeters. So out of the thousand trees that we measured, about one percent of the of the trees with critical height, where we we do have to do visual estimates due to real limitations. And because sometimes there's epiphytic obstructions and dense clouds. And when, when the height, critical height are really high up on the tree trunk, we have to sort of rely on the visual estimates. And we found that use of variations is actually not that critical. Um, with adequate trainings among the student field crews that you actually can get people to cite uh, quite the same critical height where the critical height is and we use in our experiments we only use one person to do the wheel running split plot so applicabilities we believe that critical height samplings might not be suitable for trees or for stands which are quite old it, it, it's really suitable for young to middle age stands or uh, when trees are growing fast because we critical height sampling team miles develop a methods um, to, to be able to use prior sampling to estimate growth. 
And so in, in our experience, young to mid-age plantations, reclayable and dense, dense crowds are actually quite suitable for clear eye samplings. We believe that maybe between the first and second thinning operations that is, is critical eye sampling is quite applicable. And minimum understory vegetation is always a good plus. And one thing that's, that we are thinking that might be applicable for critical eye sampling is that if you have fire, after fire, you have standing snags, and then you want to estimate the standing snags, and you do want to touch the trees, or then you want to estimate the volumes, then critical height samplings allow you to estimate volume without any measurements. And nice thing with standing snags that all the tree crowns are gone, or mostly, or tree crowns are gone, and you have a very clear bowl, a clear visual, visuals of the bowl. So we, my students, my graduate students develop and we are working on these Android applications that uh, for the past two years and it allows us to uh, using the technology from the phone that with the capability of zooming, we we able to develop the um, the HPS uh, an, an sort of a radioscope type of uh, digital radioscopes that allow us to cite the critical heights where the critical height is, and we we able these Android apps allow us to do upper stand diameters and other things that we are interested. In. So we like uh, at the end of my conversations, I like to thank Tingya, my one graduate students, for the wonderful drawing that goes into these presentations, and Zhi Xuan for his he's been developing the Android applications for the past two years. And this is the some of the screenshots that you saw. And Jeff and Tom for discussion on anti anti static in audience critical high sampling. And also especially thanks for Kim. He has uh, talked to me a lot about critical high samplings. I get to know critical high sampling through him, and it's very interesting. Is I uh, get me started on critical high samplings. And a lot of graduate and undergraduate students they have been involved for the field from for the past four years because when we find fundings. We, the, we don't have a constant funding to do the pre high samplings. So we have had extra money for my projects, we will do them. So some of funding comes from the National Science and Technology Council Taiwan, as well as National Taiwan Universities. And we, we thank the National Taiwan University Experimental Forest for the help with the logistics and uh, that allow us to do the, the sampling. So that concludes the, my talk about the preliminary studies of the critical high sampling. So any questions, um, I'm happy to address them. Thank you. Thank you, Lam. Before yeah. I turn off the recording and we go to, over to the questions, let me just quickly uh, announce the upcoming webinar on January 26th. Um, in yeah, upcoming January, uh, where we'll have Sheng Yang from the University of Tennessee and his collaborator um, Thomas Brandes from the Southern Research Station. They will be talking about uh, mixed effects random forest algorithm that uh, they use to model allometric relationships for Caribbean trees. Um, and, oh, and so I just posted in the chat the information where to subscribe to the mailing list to hear more about the upcoming webinars. And with that, I'm going to turn off the recording and open up the floor um, to questions for Lam.